And so this is the session on the Julia Scientific Machine Learning uh, so open source software ecosystem. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a quick introduction to what this ecosystem is about and the kinds of problems that are solved. And then you'll see various aspects of people working in Julia doing scientific machine learning and generally scientific computing um, in, in different aspects. So first of all, what I, what I really want to introduce is why scientific machine learning has a major software issue that needs to be solved, right? And, and the key here is really that, you know, solving stiff ODEs is numerically difficult, right? Like, you know, if, if you think about stiff ODEs, that itself is already a numerically difficult problem. But we've automated it so much that non-math undergrads regularly solve this kind of problem just by, you know, ODE 1.5 or whatever you use in, in SciPy, right? Like all th that, that is a problem that's been so automated that you don't even think about stiff ODEs being hard anymore. And what the SIMO or open source or software organization is looking to do is automate scientific machine learning to that extent, right? Like everything that we've been seeing on scientific machine learning and, um, and on high performance methods for scientific computing throughout SIMCSE, this organization wants to automate it so that way, just as easy as doing OD for one for uh, one five S, you can just as easily do model order reduction with neural surrogates and everything involved. You know, it should be to that level. Um, and and so you know, if you if you're not aware, right? What is what is scientific machine learning? What is this big overarching problem that we're that we're trying to solve here? It's model-based data efficient machine learning, right? So, so you, it's not something where you just have models, like, you know, so, so in, in, in a lot of scientific computing problems, you have a big partial differential equation. That is part of the problem, right? You know, we, we have this, this physical knowledge that's given to us in the form of, you know, partial differential equations, but we also have a lot of data. So, you know, the traditional way of using data would be to, for example, use a neural network, um, but, neural networks don't necessarily capture all the physics unless you have a whole lot of data. And where can you get this extra data from? Well, the model, right? Because, you know, physical simulations, they've been validated over many, many, many data sets. And so in some sense, it's like an infinite reservoir of truth data that you can always pull from to kind of augment your, 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 your actual data, your actual big data set. Right. So scientific machine learning is, is about trying to use these two aspects together, right? So, so, you know, how can you put neural networks inside of PDE solvers and PDE solvers to solve neural networks and all these different connections. And, you know, everyone's been, uh, there's been a lot of talk about this at SIMCSE, but what I want to focus on is why is this a software problem, right? What, what is the software problem that needs to happen and needs to be solved in conjunction with the mathematics? Um, and the easiest way to kind of showcase this is to describe it on one of my recent research projects for high, high fidelity surrogates of ocean columns for climate models. So as part of the MIT Caltech uh, uh, Co uh, coalition on on building a new climate system in Pier Julia. There's this uh, uh, there's this clima climate model, which is using a lot of new finite uh, finite volume methods and, and stuff like that. But you can't necessarily solve the entire ocean, right? You you cannot to high fidelity re uh, resolve every little detail of the Earth's ocean. That would require more compute than we have on Earth. So what what people do today is you take you you take the ocean column and you turn it into a simpler model. Right, so you say, um, I don't need to necessarily know about what ha everything that happens in the X and Y plane. I want to capture what happens to temperature um, in just the Z plane um, over time in, you know, in a box. And then I have many of these boxes all over the earth. Right? So um, the, the question here is, you know, that we start from a Navier-Stokes with a Boston-esque approximation, um, but doing this at every single box in the ocean would be too expensive. Can we learn faster models, right? And so this is something where um, people have approached this from a non-scientific machine learning uh, approach for, for many years, right? This is actually the, the core behind most uh, cl climate models today, where you'd say, well, I would have, you know, if, if I do an integral in the XY plane, I can average out a lot of the physics and, and come up with a, you know, come up with a one-dimensional partial differential equation with a closure relationship. And now that closure relationship itself is where physical approximations have to come in. So one common closure relation that that's done for, for this kind of model is what's called the convective adjustment. And so if you did this model, but without the neural network, you would be at one of the standard ways that people have transformed the, these ocean columns to be something that you'd now use within a full climate model. 
but we know that that, that doesn't hit full accuracy. So you can start to say, well, you know, a neural network is a universal function approximator. Let's have that capture the things that, you know, we've, we've captured a lot of the physics in the convective adjustment, but there are some physics we haven't captured. So now here's our full knowledge embedded form with a neural network in there. And let's train this to be able to give us a better approximation to the original ocean column by using it against data. You know, so we can do the 3D simulation to get data. Now we do the 1D simulation from this form, and then we can make we train the neural network such that it's now able to recreate the three-dimensional partial differential equation. Um, it works okay if you then just say, well, I have a neural network in the flux term, so let me just uh, train the neural network to match the, the missing fluxes. But it doesn't tend to work all that well, right? Um, so if you just do straight machine learning of the neural network and then put the neural network into the partial differential equation, it doesn't necessarily, cap uh, it can train well, but it has some training issues. Um, and so why would it still have these training issues when people say that, you know, scientific machine learning is going to save the world? Well, it's because this isn't necessarily the whole training problem, right? You can't necessarily train the neural network separately from, uh, separately from the solve of the partial differential equation because what this is effectively doing is it is making sure that the derivative is correct. And if you only try to control the derivative in, in a problem, over time, you'll get a drift in your solution because, I mean, that's what you'd expect with a derivative control. So, you know, as, as an engineer, from an engineering standpoint, how should you be doing this instead of controlling the derivative? Well, you can, should control the integral, right? So, you know, what you want to do then is you want to say, I want to train this neural network such, the, such that the solution of the partial differential equation matches the data that I have the, from the three-dimensional partial differential equation. And if you're then trying to make sure that it's working on the solutions, right, so the integral of the PDE, um, you tend to get much better results. And so here, for example, we show what happens at a training data set. So and we, we, we train this neural network on different areas of the ocean, and we pick a new ocean column with new physical parameters that we haven't trained it yet. Um, and you're able to see that it's able to get very quick, very, very well capture the change in temperature over time in, in, the, in the Z axis. Um, it actually, it's, it's able to do this at a higher fidelity than all of these parameterizations that are actually used within the Klima climate model. So it, it's, it's better than all of our, our physical ones. And this is what we're actually going to be putting in the climate model. And there's a paper coming out about this uh, soon. So, so, you know, this is like, you know, this canonical thing with scientific machine learning, where you take all of your physical knowledge and you augment it with neural networks, and then you use it to be able to improve the, the actual uh, predictions. But, you know, the, the real question, you know, the mathematical question is, how do you actually fit neural networks inside of a simulator? And you might say, oh, it's just an adjoint, but it's actually a much deeper problem than that. So for example, you know, if, you, if you're to take the neural ordinary differential equations paper, it tells you how you can take the derivative of, a, um, of, a, of an equation with a lot of parameters. If you think about the weights of the neural network inside of your differential equation as just being parameters of that differential equation, well, what we would tell you to do is you solve an ODE forwards, you solve a, a, a specific ODE backwards, and that gives you your derivative. And so, you know, there, a machine, some machine learning paper says this is how you backpropagate an ODE, and that solves the problem, right? Well, you know, with our numerical analysis hats on, we have to ask a lot of questions, right? Like, is this something that is stable? Um, what is the asymptotic complexity of doing this, right? And it turns out that this is a very deep problem. Um, and if you, if you actually look at the ocean column problem, right, you know, we, we had something that's, that's basically like an extended advection equation. So what if we do this algorithm um, you know, this algorithm says it computes what the, the, the accurate gradients. Um, but what if we do this algorithm on, uh, on that ocean column problem? Well, we can actually see that it's going to fail. And we, we can see that actually very easily on the advection equation. Because, you know, if you just do the discretization of the advection equation, you have to do upwinding, right, in order to make sure that's stable. So let's say we do the upwinding discretization of the advection equation. We solve it forwards. Um, when you solve in reverse, you have to flip the sign of your differential equation. And so now we're using downwinding. And so therefore the adjoint solve, that reverse solve is unconditionally unstable. And now, you know, so, so what, what this means is that if you use just a standard upwinding scheme to turn the PDE into an ODE, and then you use the algorithm for, you know, calculating the adjoint of the differential equation as defined by the neural ordinary differential equations paper, it's either unconditionally unstable in the forward pass or it's unconditionally stable in the adjoint pass. 
So either your your either your solution has infinite, um, you know, ha, is incorrect for any delta t that you choose, or your derivative is incorrect for any delta t that you choose. Either way, this is telling us that you know this is not a problem that you can just kind of ignore all the computational science aspects of. This is a problem where you have to really dig in and, and develop methods that are you know stable and, and able to handle these kinds of equations. Um, and, and so what we've shown is that even interpolating adjoints can fail on some equations. So, you know, you, you take uh, the uh, CVODES method um, for, for, for calculating adjoints with respect to uh, the derivatives with respect to parameters, um, you know, so, so sundials is the suite that's, that's really well known and loved. But if you use their method on, for example, a neural, or, neural ordinary differential equation, which is trying to match data from a very highly stiff combustion reaction, you actually see that you have gradients that are very ill conditioned and it's not able to train that effectively. And so there are different adjoint techniques that are able to, to stabilize this. And so this is actually then a really difficult problem then because even methods with some form of stabilization don't have enough for some other stiff problems. Um, and, and so for example, what you might need to do in some cases is differentiate through the solver because that, that you can actually show that um, that is something that has uh, the same consistency as, as the forward pass itself. But it, it's not as easy as then saying, well, always do automatic differentiation of the solver then, because this takes orders of magnitude more memory and sometimes more compute time than these other techniques. So you know, now we start having to say, well, you know, you can do back solve adjoints, which is the, the, the neural ODE way, which um, it gives you, which uses O of one memory usage, but it's unstable in a lot of problems like stiff ODEs and partial differential equations. Um, you can use the interpolating adjoint, which is what you get from something like Sundial CVODES. But, you know, that, that, that is stable enough for some problems, not stable enough for others. It's faster than automatic differentiation through the solver, but it, you know, but it, it isn't able to handle all the problems. And so there really becomes this matrix just, just like with stiff ODE solvers, you know, you need to choose the right way of calculating derivatives for different problems, and it, and it changes in a problem-specific way. Um, and, and so not only that, but in, when you write down the adjoint equation, there's a vector Jacobian product implicit within these. And so you can't really do adjoints in a way that is efficient without having the reverse mode automatic differentiation as part of it. So, uh, so here, for example, you know, this is the classic adjoint equation of an ordinary differential equation. Uh, if you look at this term right here, this is the Jacobian of the ODE, um, the transpose of that multiplied by a vector. Right. So if you, if you use something like um, like the sundials or the PETC time, uh, time stepping library, right, they do have a form of automatic differentiation or they do have a form of an adjoint in there, but their adjoint, because it's a purely numerical software, um, and it requires doing this calculation to build a, a you know, to, to essentially do these vector Jacobian products in a numerical way, which requires O of N evaluations. But there's actually a trick that if you allow yourself to utilize reverse mode automatic differentiation and compiler tools, you can tell it to run forwards with the value of U, and you tell it to reverse with the value of lambda. And with just O of one F evaluation, you can do a vector Jacobian product. And so, so this adds another complexity to it, right? That where you have you have a whole matrix of, of different types of, of adjoint methods you might possibly need to use in, in different scenarios. Um, but even when you are using this in, in, in a specific scenario, that adjoint method still requires having to have you know, compiler-based optimizations. And you know, it cannot be something where you just have a C++ library, which is pre-compiled because it does this, you know, th this type of adjoint. It really needs to have an integration with the differentiable programming and automatic differentiation to do this efficiently. And so this is where we kind of come to these days where we say, this is, this is a problem that needs to be solved if we want to, to forward the field of scientific machine learning, right? We, we, need, we need versions of, of the software which have both have the stabilized methods. So stiff ODE solvers with forms of the adjoints that are able to handle stiffness without diverging, um, which you know th that's something that, that a lot of the uh, standard machine learning libraries don't tend to have. But you need to have that at the same time as having integration of the reverse monomic differentiation into the adjoint calls, which is not something that the C++ or, or the older C++ numerical libraries tend to have. So to really have the most performance and the most stability, you need a whole bunch of different choices and you need a whole bunch of software integration between all the different layers. And this is really where the SciML ecosystem um, has found you know, that, there, that there's really a gap that needs to be solved in order to do uh, scientific machine learning in, in this next decade. 
Um, and so we've been building this on top of the differential equations that JL solvers, which, you know, not only does it get faster than something like SciPy or, or MATLAB, we also show that it's able to outperform the classic methods like uh, CVODE and RAD out in a, in a lot of these cases. Um, and so it's really about trying to get the, all these features like, um, you know, all these different adjoint methods, making it so that way you can just define an ODE and then when you say train my neural network, it automatically is able to build a back pass that is stable and allows the user to be able to give keyword arguments to say, well, I know that my problem has these stability features. So let me change my, my you know, let's change from the non-stiff version to the stiff version for not just the forward pass, but also in the way that I'm doing the, the adjoint calculations. And so everything at this point is pretty well automated. So that way, if you do things like, you know, high, uh, high order uh, uh, implicit explicit methods for, you know, uh, matrix free Newton Krylov uh, preconditioned GM res, if you throw these things all together and then you say, you know, now use this form of adjoint, it's able to build the code for, for doing these kinds of things. And so this means that we can start to bring scientific machine learning to the level that we've been actually doing our physical simulations with. Um, and so this is just like an intermediate conclusion because you know the rest of, of the symposium will be uh, other individuals and contributors for, to the SIMO ecosystem describing features that they've been adding to this, this whole area and, and other ways that they've been applying it in, in different applications. Um, but hopefully that gives you kind of an overview of why SIML has a major software problem and what needs to be solved in this, this next decade.